Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is simulation of circuit analysis topics. Our objective is to use circuit simulation software to aid the study of circuit analysis topics, including superposition theorem, mesh analysis, and nodal analysis. As a bonus feature, I'll briefly discuss using a supernode, where a supernode is a technique used in nodal analysis when you encounter voltage sources that do not have a series internal resistance that would ordinarily permit conversion to a current source. As I mentioned previously, circuit simulation software makes an excellent self-assessment resource, especially in the case of superposition theorem, where circuit analysis must be performed from the perspective of each individual source. Circuit simulation software allows the circuit to be progressively simulated from the perspective of each source or altogether. The progressive simulations ideally should closely match those obtained by manual calculations. We'll first go over superposition theorem, and then for those trained or interested in this topic, we'll continue on to mesh and nodal analysis. Let us begin. Consider this series parallel source with two sources. EA is a 40 volt source, and EB is a 15 volt source. R1 is a 500 ohm resistor, R2 is a 200 ohm resistor, R3 is a 600 ohm resistor, and R4 is a 400 ohm resistor. By all means, pause the lecture and see if you can solve for the voltage drop across and the current through each individual resistive component. And once you've done this, go ahead and account for magnitude, polarity, and direction and determine the total response for this series parallel circuit with two sources. From the perspective of just the EA source, EB is removed by replacing it with a short circuit. This places R2, R3, and R4 perfectly in parallel with one another the parallel simplification is called R prime. R prime is in series with R1. The voltage divider rule can be used to solve for the voltage drop across R prime to be 7.2 volts, positive to negative, top to bottom. Therefore, V2, V3, and V4 are also 7.2 volts, positive to negative, top to bottom. Additionally, the voltage divider rule can be used to solve for V1 where V1 is 32.8 volts, positive to negative, left to right. Ohm's law can be used to solve for the current through each individual resistive element, where I1 is determined to be 65.7 milliamperes, left to right. I2 is determined to be 35.8 milliamperes, top to bottom. I3 is determined to be 11.9 milliamperes, top to bottom. And I4 is determined to be 17.9 milliamperes, top to bottom. From the perspective of the EB source, EA is removed by replacing it with a short circuit. This places R1 in parallel with R2, a simplification I'll call R single prime, and R3 in parallel with R4, a simplification I'll call R double prime. R single prime and R double prime are in a pure series relationship, such that current will flow in the following fashion, where the polarity of the voltage drop across R double prime is positive to negative, top to bottom, and polarity of the voltage drop across V single prime is positive to negative, bottom to top. The VDR can be used to solve for the voltage drop across R double prime and R single prime, where V single prime is found to be 5.6 volts, and V double prime is found to be 9.4 volts. Therefore, V3 and V4 are 9.4 volts, positive to negative, top to bottom. V2 is 5.6 volts, positive to negative, bottom to top, and V1 is 5.6 volts, positive to negative, left to right. Ohm's law can be used to solve for the current through each resistive element, where I1 is determined to be 11.2 milliamperes, left to right. I2 is determined to be 28 milliamperes, bottom to top. I3 is determined to be 15.7 milliamperes, top to bottom. And I4 is determined to be 23.5 milliamperes, top to bottom. Now that we've solved for all linear circuit properties, from the perspective of both sources, the only task that remains us is to summate these values accounting for magnitude, polarity, and direction. I1 is found to be 76.9 milliamperes of current traveling left to right because both sources are aiding one another. V1 is found to be 38.4 volts left to right. I2 is found to be 7.8 milliamperes of current traveling top to bottom because the sources oppose one another. The voltage drop across R2 is found to be 1.6 volts top to bottom. The current through resistor 3 is found to be approximately 27.6 milliamperes traveling top to bottom. And the voltage drop across R3 
is found to be 16.6 volts top to bottom. The current through resistor 4 is found to be 41.4 milliamperes traveling top to bottom, and the voltage drop across resistor 4 is also found to be 16.6 volts top to bottom. Now we'll go ahead and build and simulate this circuit using multi-sim. First we'll simulate it from the perspective of EA with EB removed, then we'll simulate it from the perspective of EB with EA removed, and finally we'll simulate it with both sources active. The values we obtain through our simulation software should be very close to those obtained by manual calculation methods. First we'll open up our simulator of choice and place the desired sources and components on the virtual breadboard. My sincere recommendation is to not hook up the components and sources until you've added the ammeters and voltmeters. Next we'll place ammeters in convenient locations. Note the polarity of all these ammeters. The indoor is on the top and the outdoor is on the bottom. If we get a negative value, it means that same magnitude of current is entering the outdoor and leaving the indoor. Now we'll place voltmeters in parallel with the resistive elements. Now we can go ahead and wire up our ammeters in series internal to our series parallel circuit. Then we can wire up the voltmeters parallel to the resistive elements. Again, note the polarity of the voltmeters. The voltmeter being used to measure the voltage drop across resistive element 1 is positive to negative left to right. All other voltmeters are positive to negative top to bottom. If we get a negative value, it means our assumed direction of polarity is incorrect. Now we'll go ahead and add some junctions to our series parallel circuit to make adding short circuits a little bit easier. We'll go up to Place, Junction. We'll add junctions to the top and bottom of EA and the left and right of EB. We'll add a wire in parallel to EB, which effectively short circuits it. We can now remove source EB. When we press play to simulate the circuit, note that our ammeters and voltmeters obtain values consistent with our manual calculations. Note that ammeter 1 is reading a negative value because it's indoors at the top and the outdoors in the bottom. We can stop the simulation and remove the short circuit from EB. Now place the short circuit around EA and then remove EA. When we press play to simulate the circuit, Notice we're obtaining values very consistent with our manual analysis from the perspective of EB only. Again, note that the polarity of voltage drops and direction of currents is dictated by the permanent placement of the ammeter in and outdoors and the voltmeters assume positive and negative. Now we can go ahead and reinsert EA and remove the short circuit. Back in our original configuration, we can press play to simulate the circuit. With both sources active, we're obtaining values in our ammeters and voltmeters consistent with our total superposition analysis. Again, note that the polarity of the voltmeters and directions indicated by the ammeter are dictated by the permanent placement of in and outdoors and assumed positive and negative polarities. Regardless, we're obtaining values very consistent with what we obtained with manual calculations. This concludes the superposition portion of the simulation of circuit analysis topics. For those trained in mesh analysis and nodal analysis, stick around and we'll try this again. Let's try mesh analysis first. By all means, pause the lecture and see if you can use mesh analysis to determine the current inside each loop. These loop currents can then be used to solve for other pertinent electrical properties. We'll start with loop current IX, assumed to travel clockwise. The polarity of voltage drops from the perspective of the IX loop current will be as follows. Loop current IY is also assumed to be in a clockwise direction. The polarity of voltage drops as induced by the IY current is as follows. Notice the voltage drop across R2 has two different sets of polarity as seen by the IX and the IY loop. Finally consider loop current IZ also traveling in the clockwise direction. From the perspective of IZ, the voltage drop across R3 and R4 have the following polarities. Again note that V3 is an element shared by two loops and as such has two opposite voltage polarities. Now we'll determine the Kirchhoff's voltage law equations for loop X. Loop X has a rise EA and a fall V1 and a fall V2. Substituting in the necessary values and arranging it in the general format yields 700 IX minus 200 IY plus 0 IZ equals 40. We'll place the final general format equation to this side and begin our analysis of loop Y. The KVL equation for loop Y is rise EB equals fall V3 plus fall V2. 
substituting in necessary values and arranging it in the general format yields negative 200 IX plus 800 IY minus 600 IZ equals 15. We'll place the final general format equation at this side and begin our analysis of loop C. The KVL equation for loop Z is V3 plus V4 equals zero. Substituting in the necessary values and arranging it in the general format equation yields zero IX minus 600 IY plus 1000 IZ equals zero. We'll place the final general format for loop Z to this side and continue on with the problem. These general format equations for the three loops with three independent variables can be placed into a three by four matrix, where the reduced row echelon format function yields IX equals 76.9 milliamperes, IY equals 69 milliamperes, and IZ equals 41.4 milliamperes, consistent with our earlier superposition theorem analysis. In this case, I1 is 76.9 milliamperes left to right. I2 is 7.9 milliamperes downwards because Ix and Iy are in opposition to each other. Current I3 is 27.6 milliamperes downwards because Iy and Iz are in opposition to each other. Finally, current I4 is found to be 41.4 milliamperes downwards. When we return to our circuit simulation software, this time using only ammeters, the simulation yields results consistent with our mesh analysis. Let's move on to nodal analysis. Be warned, this isn't your ordinary nodal analysis circuit, since EB is a voltage source without a resistor in series. This complicates ordinary nodal analysis and necessitates something called a supernode. Those trained in normal nodal analysis would assume that there are two relevant nodes, Vx and Vy, and we can use nodal analysis to determine voltage at these relevant nodes with respect to some previously assumed reference node. In this case, we'll ground the bottom node and assume that this is our reference. However, source EB is a voltage source with no internal series resistance, and necessitates the use of something called a super node, where a super node replaces EB with its short circuit equivalent, and then is analyzed from the perspective of Kirchhoff's current law, where all unknown current is assumed to leave it. Following KCL analysis of the super node, we'll again return to our previous assumption of two independent nodes Vx and Vy. Assuming all current is leaving the supernode, the KCL analysis for the supernode is I1 plus I2 plus I3 plus I4 equals zero. Substituting in the necessary values and placing in the general format equation, we're left with one over 500 plus one over 200 Vx plus one over 600 plus one over 400 Vy equals 80 milliamperes. Inside the supernode, given that EB is strung between VY to VX, positive to negative, it can be stated that VY minus VX equals 15 volts. Rearranging it into the general format equation such that VX is in front of VY, we're left with negative VX plus VY equals 15. We're ultimately left with two equations with two unknowns that relate VX and VY to each other. These two equations can be placed inside a two by three matrix, where the RREF function yields a value of approximately 1.6 volts for Vx and Vy to be approximately 16.6 volts with reference to our previously agreed upon node. When two voltmeters are incorporated into our circuit simulation software with reference to the bottom node, the voltmeters indicate values consistent with values obtained via manual nodal analysis using a super node. These nodal voltages can then be used to solve for other pertinent electrical properties. For example, the voltage drop across resistor one would be 40 volts minus 1.6 volts, yielding the approximately 38.4 volt drop across R1 as we anticipated. Successive analysis of this same series parallel circuit incorporating multiple sources yielded the same results, and circuit simulation software verified that we were on the right track. This goes to show you that there's more than one way to skin a cat. My preferred method is superposition theorem. However, mesh and nodal analysis yield the same results, with a little bit more trickery. This concludes the simulation of circuit analysis topics lecture. In conclusion, we use circuit simulation software to aid the study of circuit analysis topics, including superposition theorem, mesh analysis, and nodal analysis. Additionally, I briefly introduced the supernode technique. 
Long story short, circuit analysis and simulation software makes an excellent resource for self-assessment of these complex circuit analysis techniques. Remember to view these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.